Well, good evening again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another installment of Astronomy Toronto. My name is Randy Atwood, and I'm a member of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Astronomy Toronto is a news magazine where we look at topics of interest uh, of amateur and professional astronomers, what they're up to here in Toronto, and astronomy across Canada. Uh, tonight is a, a uh, that during tonight's show, we'll be uh, inviting you to phone us in to ask us any questions you may have on astronomical topics, whatever we might be talking about tonight, or anything you might have, uh, any questions you might have to ask. On July 5th, uh, Toronto will experience a very, very beautiful event up in the sky. That is a total eclipse of the moon. Now, this total eclipse uh, lasts all night, the Monday night, July the 5th. And with me uh, from the McLaughlin Planetarium is my good friend, Ian McGregor, who is also the president of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society. He's brought along a few diagrams and slides to show us exactly how this eclipse will be occurring and exactly what we'll be able to see uh, this July. So again, Ian, thank you for joining us on Astronomy. Good evening, Randy. Glad to be here. Well, I think, uh, why don't we start with the moon itself, uh, learn a bit about our, our nearest neighbour in the sky and the brightest object apart from uh, the sun. The moon is an object that I think we often take for granted when we're thinking about astronomy. It's a uh, it's an object which uh, much of the month it's up in the sky we can easily see it uh, after the sun it's the brightest object that we can see in the sky and perhaps it might be worthwhile just to kind of look at the moon and see what kind of an object this this nearest neighbor to us in space is first of all it's the earth's only natural satellite uh, we've got something of the order of about four thousand five thousand man-made objects that are orbiting around the earth but the moon is our only natural satellite that that we know about the moon is an object which is about a quarter of the size of the Earth. Uh, it is orbiting around the Earth in a period of about, uh, roughly about 30 days, just about uh, a month. And it's actually no accident that our word moon and the word month are, are very similar to each other. They both contain about 30 days. It's uh, an object that if we look at a picture of the moon and, and, and study it closely, we can see that there are light colored and dark colored markings on the face of the moon. Uh, we have uh, the, the dark areas which are lunar seas. Um, they got that name a long, long time ago, but of course we today know that the seas are just uh, flat plains of basically frozen lava. Uh, some people, when they've looked up in the moon at various times, have thought they could see a man in the moon or a man's face or a rabbit in the moon or a lady in the moon. Uh, but these are, these are basically uh, flat lava plains on the moon. Well, the full moon is a, a very beautiful object, and we have a slide of the full moon where we'll be able to see these, these dark areas. Now, the dark areas, the seas, they're, they're, they're lower, they're flat. Yeah, they're very flat areas. These are basically where the astronauts landed. Uh, we have a photograph of the, of the moon. The dark areas, again, are the lunar seas. We recognize about 17 of these seas on the near side of the Earth to us, uh, near side of the moon to us. Uh, we have to realize the moon always keeps the same face towards the Earth. Uh, the light-colored areas that we see in the photograph are craters, or very heavily cratered areas, what we call the lunar highlands. And it was an area which the astronauts would have liked to land it in, but they didn't because it's a rather dangerous place to come down with spacecraft. Now, as far as our eclipse is concerned, uh, it's perhaps important to realize that the moon is orbiting around the Earth. And uh, during the course of a, a month, a lunar month, as the moon orbits around the Earth, it has a changing appearance in the sky. Uh, we could start off uh, showing a, a, a picture of the, of the moon, uh, perhaps as a crescent moon, and uh, then go right through a series of, of pictures showing these different phases of the moon. Um, we go from, uh, here we have a picture of a first, uh, well, a very young crescent moon, and perhaps as we very slowly go through these uh, sequence of slides, we can go on to the next slide and we'll start to see um, more and more detail of the moon as the moon goes around the Earth. Uh, when we cannot see the moon, that's the phase known as new moon. The moon mm -hmm. is between the Earth and the sun. Uh, but as we continue to go from slide to slide, we can see more and more of the, of the moon. We're going through uh, a waxing crescent moon. There, there we are, first quarter moon. Uh, that's roughly what the moon is like tonight. We're now going into uh, um, a waxing gibbous moon. And very soon we're going to be getting to a, a full moon. I'm uh, getting very, very close to that now. When we have a full moon, the sun, the earth, and the moon are in a line. And of course, when we look at the moon like this, we're seeing the moon by reflected sunlight. It's not the moon that's actually giving off its own light. It's light from the sun that we're seeing. And then as after we have the new mo full moon, sorry, we keep on going along through this. We can see the other uh, phases. This is a, 
uh, waning gibbous moon. We get around to uh, what we call last quarter moon. Uh, we still see these same, there's the last quarter moon. We can see these uh, dark seas that are still present. And uh, continue to go along, we find uh, we're now into a, a waning crescent moon. And uh, again, it takes roughly about a month to go through all these phases. Um, we get along to uh, a very, very thin crescent. And then I think we have one more slide. That's it. And that's our, our waning crescent. And uh, after this, we go again to a new moon phase when the moon is again between the Earth and the sun, and we cannot see it. Now, to understand perhaps what is happening as far as lunar eclipses are concerned, uh, and this is our particular topic of event as far as July 5th and 6th are concerned, mm -hmm. we had to realize that between, um, at various times, you have lineups between the Earth and uh, between the sun, the moon, and the Earth. Um, we might come along and uh, consider the fact that uh, if we have uh, the orbit of the Earth, if the moon was in the same orbit as the Earth's orbit, this would mean that we would end up having uh, eclipses every time the moon moved in front of the sun mm -hmm. and every time the moon moved through the Earth's so shadow. So every month there would be an e two eclipses? Every, we'd have two eclipses every month. Uh, a solar eclipse when the moon is between the Earth and the, the sun, and a lunar eclipse when the Earth is between the moon and the sun. Mm -hmm. However, this is not the case. Uh, and the reason this occurs is because uh, the Earth's, sorry, the moon's orbit is tilted mm -hmm. at an angle five degrees with respect to the plane mm -hmm. of the Earth's orbit, as we can see in, in this diagram. Mm -hmm. And uh, this tilt is sufficient to make it uh, mean that we do not have that many eclipses. We have perhaps a maximum of seven eclipses that might occur in a year, solar or lunar. Mm -hmm. uh, I think perhaps we could look at uh, uh, perhaps a picture of the slide of a, of a solar eclipse. A solar eclipse occurs when the uh, moon is between the Earth and the, and the Sun. Uh, there are several different kinds of solar eclipse, and what we're showing a picture of is the most spectacular kind of a solar eclipse, a total solar eclipse. Although the Moon is about 400 times smaller than the Sun, it is also about 400 times closer to us than the Sun. And the result is that these two objects, the Sun and the Moon, have the same apparent size in the sky, about half a degree. That's about half a finger width. We came along and took our finger held at an arm's length, uh, about half a finger width, about half a degree. Mm -hmm. Well, we have these spectacular total solar eclipses that can occur. You know, we've both experienced several of these eclipses in our ex solar ex eclipse expeditions we've gone on. But you have to go, usually, somewhere to see a total eclipse exactly. of the sun. We had to exactly. go to Africa to get that, that picture. There's also a very narrow part of the Earth which you can actually see a total eclipse of the sun from. But it's very different with a lunar eclipse. Lunar eclipse is quite different. Um, uh, on one hand, a solar eclipse can be very fast. It only lasts a few minutes, and then the spectacular part is gone, as we saw in that, that slide that we saw of the total solar eclipse. A lunar eclipse, though, takes place over a much longer period of time. Uh, this lunar eclipse that's taking place in July, for example, is going to be taking place over just a little over six hours from the beginning of the eclipse until the end. And even that maximum totality, when the moon is going to be immersed in the Earth's shadow, it still takes um, uh, a while for the, Earth, the, the moon to pass through that. I think perhaps we have uh, a diagram which uh, perhaps illustrates uh, that. Um, well, it's going, going to slide, I guess it is. This is just showing the geometry of the uh, Earth, moon, and, and sun. Mm -hmm. In this, we have on the right, we have the sun. Uh, sitting roughly about the middle, we have the Earth. And the, the light from the sun is uh, uh, hits the Earth and produces a shadow, sort of in the tail of the Earth. And this produces a, a long shadow. The Earth's shadow extends out to a distance about three times greater than the moon's distance from the Earth. And this shadow is fairly large. In fact, at the moon's distance from the Earth, the diameter of the Earth's shadow, as we can see in this diagram that uh, we have here, um, the diameter of the shadow of the Earth um, it has actually two components to it, an umbra and a penumbra. The diameter of the umbra, which is the, the dark central region of the eclipse, is about the same diameter as that of the Earth, about 12,000 kilometers. On the other hand, our, uh, our poor little moon is only about uh, 4,000 kilometers in, in diameter, mm -hmm. and uh, it takes a while for it to move through this very dark central region of the shadow. Well, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to remember that the moon, as a, the moon travels across the sky from east to west as the Earth turns, the moon travels its own distance from west to east 
And that's why it takes so long for the eclipse to happen. The moon is slowly moving through. I think we have a, another diagram uh, later on which shows that. I think we do, yeah. This is uh, this basically is showing our, our, our shadow conditions. The, the dark region, the umbra, is when the moon is, is into that, we have a total eclipse. Uh, the umbra is something which we don't really see very well. It's kind of a half shadow region uh, around the Earth, uh, around the, that area of the sky. Now, I think perhaps we have another diagram that we could show, which might help to uh, explain a little bit about this. Again, I mentioned we don't have a, an eclipse every time the moon is at the full moon phase. Uh, a full moon is the only time that you can have a total lunar eclipse occurring. And in this diagram, it's showing us the, the fact that the uh, orbit of the moon uh, is again inclined about five degrees to that of the Earth. It means, for example, that the moon can pass high above the Earth's shadow, uh, as we have in the diagram, so that we would have, for example, um, uh, along here, we have kinds of total eclipses, or eclipses of the moon, which can occur. And again, we have a diagram which illustrates uh, these different types. Uh, we could have, first of all, the moon just passing through the penumbra, mm -hmm. or the half-shadow region. Um, and we have this in the bottom part of our diagram. Um, the moon might get just slightly darker, uh, but it's very hard to spot a penumbral eclipse. It's not really that obvious an event that's taking place. We can also have what we call a partial eclipse of the moon. This is when the moon, uh, going, going along, passes through the Earth's shadow. It does not get completely immersed in the uh, umbra region, but uh, part of it is still out in the penumbra, and as a result, we only have a small port part of the moon which sort of disappears into uh, as a dark shadow fall across it. In the case of this particular year, we've got to three total lunar eclipses taking place. And again, in our diagram, we have uh, the moon would be coming along on its path, and it passes through the actual umbra, and it it's goes right through the very darkest region of the Earth's shadow, and as a result, we have a total lunar eclipse. I like to think, too, Ian, that uh, for when the moon is passing above, if you were standing on the moon, you would see the Earth pass by the sun. For a, uh, a penumbral, say, you'd see the Earth just take a bite of the sun so that you'd still be able to see part of the sun. But it's only for a total eclipse of the, m of the moon. When you're standing on the moon, you see the Earth totally cover up the sun, which I'm sure would be a, a beautiful sight. Spectacular sight, I'm sure, if we were an astronaut on the surface of the moon looking out at the sight taking place. Well, they, have, uh, they actually have photographs uh, from a, an unmanned spacecraft which was on the moon. Uh, it looked up at the Earth and, and took pictures in 1966 of that site. I guess it's never really been, been seen before by, by human eyes, though. Is that the lunar eclipse that is taking place is going to be a very dark central one. Um, we've not had this dark eclipse for a number of years. Um, sometimes when the moon passes through the, the umbra of the Earth, the, the dark inner shadow, it does not pass right through the center, and the eclipse may not be that dark. But this one is going to go very, very close to the central regions. So we'll have a diagram later on to talk about mm -hmm. that. Um, uh, but it's going to be quite, a, quite an eclipse to see. It might be worthwhile just to have a, get some idea of the frequency of eclipses. And uh, we have a, a diagram that uh, shows a table that shows the eclipses that have taken place over the last number of years. Um, usually, we get no more than a max level, maximum as possible. A number of eclipses that can occur in a year uh, is seven. Uh, we do not, uh, we, this is happens to be a year when we are getting seven eclipses. These can be a combination of lunar or solar eclipses that mm -hmm. we can get. Uh, usually we get no more than maybe three or, or four solar eclipses that can occur. Um, 72, I think, was an example of a year when we had uh, seven total eclipses that, uh, seven eclipses that occurred, a combination of lunar and solar. And that's the maximum you can have. That's the maximum solar. possible that can occur. Uh, this year we have seven, uh, so that's, I guess, twice within a 10-year period we've had a ma the maximum number of eclipses. Mm -hmm. uh, if that's taking place, this means there must be an eclipse taking place very near the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have one this year on January 9th, and then we have another total lunar eclipse occurring right at the very end of the year on December 30th. Uh, but the best one for North American observers, in fact, the best one for us to look at, is the one that's taking place in July. Mm -hmm. We have another table which uh, will be able to look at the last six years of, of lunar eclipses which shows that there are actually eclipse seasons. Uh, in the year 1982, you can't have an eclipse in March. You've got to have a, an eclipse in, uh, well, I guess this is, uh, this is actually the July 5th eclipse. Maybe if we get that other table up showing the, uh, the other eclipses. Uh, 
you cannot have an eclipse in, say, 1972, I mean 1982, in uh, March. There, this year happens to be July and uh, January for, for seasons. We see in 1977 that there were eclipses, the eclipse months were April and September. And these were lunar eclipses, uh, which we could see both of, uh, one in April and one in September. And in 1978, of course, there's, you have March and September, and uh, it goes on like that. And that, these dates change slowly. About every nine years, it rotates so that you have uh, eclipses in different parts of the month. That's right. Last year, for example, we had a partial eclipse of the moon that occurred in July. And uh, this year, it's working around to, to this year. We're having a total uh, a total lunar eclipse taking place in July. And uh, next year, in fact, there's going to be another eclipse that's occurring near the tail end of June. So these are all coming relatively close together. Well, we have a diagram here, Ian, of the eclipse. Maybe we get on to the, the one that we're, we're all looking forward to, uh, weather, weather permitting. Oh, it's going to be clear. Well, I doubt it certainly all. hope so. It'll be <laughs> nice Better and be. clear. Uh, <laughs> this is more or less the track of the moon through the Earth's shadow, as we'll see it in the early mornings of July 6th. In the early morning of July 6th. I should point out that for Toronto observers, the eclipse is starting about 22 minutes after midnight on the morning of the, uh, of the 6th. Uh, in this diagram, we again have the, the Earth's uh, inner shadow, the umbra, and then this dashed area is, is showing us the, the penumbra. We have uh, the moon uh, moving uh, across from the, from the right and going over towards the left. And then roughly at about 22 minutes after midnight on the morning of July 6th, the first contact takes place, and then we start to have the moon enter the Earth's outer shadow, the penumbra. Uh, roughly at about 1.30, we have the moon start to enter the umbra. And at this point, it starts to get very noticeable that there's this shadow, this, this kind of wave of darkness that's gradually moving across the moon from left to right. Um, we then go to uh, continue throughout the eclipse, and then about in the wee hours of the morning, about 3.30, the moon is right in the middle of the umbra of the Earth. And uh, at that point, we have the darkest part of the eclipse, and it'll be the moon may almost appear to disappear at, at, at that time. Uh, about 5.29, the moon will leave the umbra, and then around 6.40, the eclipse will end. The moon will leave the Earth's outer shadow, or penumbra. Uh, we're not going to be able to see all of that uh, eclipse. Uh, unfortunately, the moon will be setting in the western sky before the eclipse is actually ended. I think uh, for anyone at home that might want to copy down those numbers, we have a table, and if we could get that up, you see that... Uh it, it's a long eclipse. It lasts, uh, the, the time, the, the duration is over six hours. Yeah, six hours, 17 minutes. And uh, it's worthwhile to, to look at the mid-eclipse. And admittedly, it's a rather strange time of the, of the morning. People are going to have to stay up pretty well all night in order to get the very best part of the eclipse. But it certainly can be a very spectacular sight to see. Um, it takes, it's certainly not like a total solar eclipse. A total solar, you've got two or three minutes, and you're enjoying this fantastic event is taking place in the sky during the daytime. Total lunar eclipse is a relatively slow-moving kind of an eclipse. I, ten I intend to get out my lawn chair with uh, maybe a bottle of wine and maybe some music or something and just enjoy it. Just relax It's really going to be a super, a super sight, too. Cl uh, weather permitting, of course. Uh, we have some slides of previous eclipses, including the one that was last summer, which we, s uh, we saw here in Toronto. We can take a look at that and uh, maybe give you a preview of, of what this eclipse is going to look like. This is last July's eclipse. Now, the moon, Ian, passed just north, just above the umbra. Just above the umbra. And what I, if, and maybe if we can go These to the next. These are your own pictures, too. Yeah, well, I'm pointing out too. sure. Uh, gee, even I can take pictures of the moon. In the next, <laughs> in the next slide, we'll see that uh, it's a bit overexposed, but you can see that the light, the darker part in the, under, at the bottom is the umbra. And you see it's a reddish color, which is a fascinating uh, aspect of a total lunar eclipse. And this point, too, is also about as far as the moon was covered in, in darkness at this point. This is about mid-eclipse, so this partial eclipse that we experience. And also, which is very a historical note, this is one of the first ways they were able to, to distinguish that the Earth was round. Because uh, way back when, I'm not sure who, who was the first one to discover that, but looking at the Earth's shadow on the moon, it appeared round, and uh, they were able to even figure out the distance to the moon by that method. That's right. It's an experiment, actually, people can try at home. If you have a you know, bright light and shine onto a wall, and you try different geometrical shapes, triangles, squares, uh, boxes, uh, whatever it happens to be, and, and look at the shadows that they make. And uh, the one that turns out best is one that uh, has a sphere. 
well, it, maybe in the next couple slides we can, we can see the progression of that eclipse. Here we see the moon moving out. This eclipse took a few hours. The moon slowly moved uh, from right to left uh, as it passed uh, through the shadow. And I think in the next one it, it's uh, just about moved all the way out. Now that was a partial eclipse. In the next couple slides we have uh, pictures of a total lunar eclipse. And what you might be very surprised to see is that the moon gets very, very red. Uh, copperish color. Uh, I remember the, the eclipse in 1975, though, was a dark eclipse, and that varies yeah. from eclipse to eclipse. It can vary right? quite a bit depending upon the amount of uh, dust and volcanic dust that's in the, in the atmosphere. This eclipse might be very dark. Um, perhaps you might explain why, it, why it's red. Uh, first of all, the moon is in the Earth's shadow, and hence there's no light. We'd think there's no light from the sun, which would be falling onto the, the moon, so mm -hmm. hence it would be dark. We can't see it. But actually what is happening is light from the sun is passing through the Earth's atmosphere, and then it's being bent. And the light that is manages to get through the Earth's atmosphere is the red light. And that red light falls on the moon and bathes it in a kind of a reddish glow. And depending upon the amount of dust or stuff that's in the, in the atmosphere at the time, particularly volcanic dust from active volcanoes or something like that, it, we can make the moon very, very red. Sometimes, for example, the moon can be almost a blood red color in the moon and in the sky, a very, very spectacular sight. And I'm not surprised that m many ancient people were very concerned when they would see these eclipses taking place and the, the moon being blocked off, uh, or, you know, parts that seem to be disappearing, and then maybe getting this very noticeable red color in the sky. Well, as I say, if you have any questions you might want to ask Ian about the eclipse or anything else of our astronomical nature, why don't you give us a call at 752-8911 and we'd be pleased to, uh, to help you out to, to answer these questions which you might have. There are several uh, other things that you can do uh, when you're watching an eclipse. See, and, uh, there is a, a bright, there, uh, we were talking about the brightness. You can measure the brightness scale. We have uh, one member in, our, in, the, Toronto, in our, the Toronto Center of the Astronomical Society who draws the eclipse. You don't necessarily have to photograph them. And film isn't that sensitive. The, the eye picks up so many different colors. A lot more detail. That, uh, detail with the eye. The drawings really give you a better appreciation of, uh, of the eclipse itself. That's right. It's possible you can make a drawing using your, your eyes alone, you know, and just kind of noticing the color that's taking place and the, the changes in the moon. You could go ahead and use a pair of binoculars. Ideally, you should have it set up on a tripod so you're not kind of looking through your binoculars and then putting them down and then making your sketch or adding on colors, uh, or looking through a telescope, for example, and, and noticing the different color changes. Uh, it is quite remarkable. The colors are not uniform. It can be browns and yellows and reds, and uh, but that's particularly red might be green too. Out. I was amazed. Last green? year we saw green. That's right. I guess we didn't see green anyway. Hello, welcome, and thanks for phoning Astronomy Toronto. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do I have to turn my TV off? Too? No, no, it's no problem. Okay. What can we do for you? Uh, I, I, well, first of all, I really enjoy this program. I'm just getting into astronomy, and I just want to tell you that. Secondly, Thank um, where is the best place um, to, to see this? Uh, can we see this from Toronto? I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the lights in the city and everything. We can't see very many stars at night, and I'm just wondering whether we can see the eclipse from Toronto. Okay, well, first of all, the moon is an extremely brilliant object, and uh, we'll have no trouble seeing it. We may end up having, having a full moon, will means we wipe out all the stars, but we'll have no trouble seeing the moon, uh, barring the presence of clouds or something like that. It might be worthwhile also to mention about like, visibility of like, where can you see this eclipse. Uh, this eclipse is visible almost over the entire Western Hemisphere, uh, South America, Central America, North America, except for uh, some of the northern regions of Canada, we'll be able to see this total lunar eclipse. Uh, a total lunar eclipse is visible from the entire hemisphere of the Earth. As long as you can see the moon. As long as you can see the moon. You can see the eclipse. That's right. But it, that's, it's very different for a solar. You have to be right underneath the very small uh, leading edge of the shadow. You've got to be in a narrow region that might be about 100 kilometers wide and about 3,000 kilometers long. And unless you're in that very narrow path, you cannot see a total solar eclipse. But a lunar eclipse is visible all over the Western Hemisphere. We'll be able to see it. Okay. Can I ask a couple of more questions? One, yeah. Give us another question. Well, okay. Um, first of all, uh, what groups can, uh, are there groups you can get into in, in order to um, start from, I guess, a, as a beginner to get into astronomy? And, oh. and then there are a couple of questions, but I don't have to pursue them with okay, regard to well, what you've already said. 
Yeah, this is the person to talk to. Ian is the president of the Toronto Centre of the Royal Astronomical Society, and we have a, a very large contingent, contingent in, in Toronto, don't we, Ian? Well, our Toronto Centre is one of actually 20 centres or clubs of the society across Canada. Our society has about 3,300 members, and there are seven, over 700 in the Toronto Centre. Uh, we hold our meetings at the McLaughlin Planetarium, and uh, the members of the society of all different ages, I guess I know our youngest members might be about 10 years old, our oldest might be as you know, old as I can <laughs> possibly think, I don't know. Uh, as old as you. They, well, well, maybe as old <laughs> as me, that's right. <laughs> but they come, they come in all, diff all different ages. Um, they can of all different backgrounds. Um, there are professional astronomers, there's amateur astronomers, uh, people of all different educational backgrounds. We hold uh, meetings which have uh, professional astronomers or scientists who give talks on different aspects of astronomy or space science. We have uh, observers meetings when uh, members of the center give reports on their observations, uh, talk about uh, constellation of the month, uh, talk about telescopes that they built or um, how to, you know, <laughs> pictures of, uh, uh, of the sky as seen from Toronto or what you can see or, uh, you know, astrophotography tips or things like that, all different kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, belonging to an amateur group gives you access to other people who are interested in astronomy and you can kind of learn from there. You might also be interested in taking astronomy courses as well, like an introductory course in astronomy. The, uh, the planetarium uh, offers a series of courses during the, the uh, autumn, winter, and the spring, and you might be interested in contacting the planetarium and uh, perhaps taking one of our, our astronomy courses. There are several other institutions, York University, University of Toronto, uh, Seneca College, I think, also have courses in astronomy. Telephone number for the uh, amateur group. I'm, I'm interested in the courses, but I'd like to start out um, in, in that kind of group. Okay, well, as far as the, the Royal Astronomical Society is concerned, the best thing is probably right, into, right to the McLaughlin Planetarium, right to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, uh, care of McLaughlin Planetarium, Good. 100 Queen's Park, Good. Uh, Toronto, and, uh, and some information will be sent out to you. Okay. Can I ask you just one more question? The gibbous moon, how do you spell it and where does the word come from? Gib this, uh, I gibbous? Think you were talking about the phases oh, oh, of the moon. Oh, gibbous? Yeah. Uh, it's spelled G-I-B-B-O-U-S. And I have to admit, I don't know the origin of the word. It always meant to me to be uh, something in between half and full. Yeah. And uh, for anyone who's interested in, in writing down the numbers, the, the times of the element, the events of the eclipse, here we have, uh, uh, oh, okay, here's your address. Boy, I'm having a bit of trouble today. Hey, thank you. Okay, there's thanks very much. Right. And maybe right. we'll just leave that on for anyone else who's interested in getting in touch, and we'll go to this next call. Hi, thanks for phoning Astronomy Toronto. Hi, uh, I just have some questions, or what I wanted to know was about the psychological effects of the moon on people. If uh, he has any comments on that as far as how it affects people's moods and... Uh, criminal acts and things like that during different phases of the moon. Okay, well I think perhaps the answer to, to that is that right now we're not really very sure. There's not, have not really been any very good studies that have ever been done linking up uh, what's happening with the moon with any kind of activity that's taking place on the Earth. Um, there was, uh, there has been uh, some study I think that was done about three or four years ago in Toronto that was studying uh, things like crime rates, uh, um, bank robberies, um, yeah, there was things like that. A, a magazine the other night talking about the high rate of uh, assassinations and suicide, things like that, during full moon and new moon. Um, okay, that, well that, if that is a, a report, I haven't, I've not seen that particular one. This uh, the report I'm thinking of is one that was done using studies and uh, data from Toronto and Toronto hospitals, poli police records, fire department records, and what it did was show no correlation. <laughs> with anything in the city of Toronto. Even, uh, even birth rates, in fact, uh, there's, there's apparently sort of a, some of a tale around that, uh, around times of full moon that you have more children being, being born. Um, this apparently seems to be a, a feeling that people have, but it's not backed up when you come along and actually study the, the hospital records. You, you do not find that there's any more births taking place around full moon than at any other particular time uh, during the, the lunar cycle. It might feel that there's a lot of different things going on. I know the full moon does strange things to me, but uh, I, I really can't put, I mean, if, if there's a force, it's, it certainly can't be gravity and it can't be light. And I don't know, but well. Nothing we've detected anyway. No. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for out, out, uh, offering us that question. Okay, thank you. Bye.
Good evening. Thanks for calling Astronomy Toronto. I'm Damien Chip. Hello? This is Damien Chip. Yes. Hi, Damien. Um, I'm asking um, what will happen when the eclipse happen on July 5th or 6th? What will happen? Well, what we're going to what we're going to see that particular evening? Well, I think first of all, in the evening uh, it is the evening of July fifth, sixth. Although, as far as an observer is concerned, here in Toronto or anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, we're actually going to be starting to observe, say, about 22 minutes after midnight. Uh, at that time, you're not going to be able to see a great deal. The eclipse starts at that time, uh, but as we move further into the further into the evening, we're going to be able to see more more detail. Um, the, it's not really until we start to get uh, the moon moving through the Earth's umbra that we start to have uh, something noticeable really taking place on the moon. We can start to see this wave of darkness again starting to move across the moon. Uh, the best time to look is going to be again the wee hours around about 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock, 3.30 in the morning. That's when we've got the best time to look. And it's difficult. You'll probably have to get to bed before midnight and wake up, wake up about one or so in the morning, and then go out and start to start your observing session. Um, what does umbra mean? Umbra, umbra is sort of uh, means actually it means shadow, and um, we have two shadows. We have an inner shadow and an outer shadow. The inner shadow we call the umbra. And this is a very dark region. The um, outer shadow is the penumbra. And it's sort of an area of sort of half shadow. You can sort of get a little bit of light from the sun that's going through. And um, we don't actually notice the penumbral shading on the moon very much when the lunar eclipse takes place. Um, thank you very much. OK, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Damien. Hey, bye. Uh, this eclipse, uh, you might be reading in the paper that this is uh, an event of the century or something, but really, oh, that's, got, that's what we got from CBC. They say. It's, it's really yeah. not. It, it happens a lot. There was a total lunar eclipse in January. Unfortunately, it, we, it was the middle of the day for us, so we couldn't see it. But it happens quite a bit. Hi, thanks for joining Astronomy Toronto. Yes, I was just wondering, um, what phase of the moon is considered the half moon? Okay, well, probably what you're thinking of a half moon, it would be a, a first quarter or a last quarter. Uh, we're just a little bit past, um, uh, well, a little bit past a first quarter moon. Um, we have uh, the phases going from, first of all, a new moon. A new moon is when the moon is between the Earth and the Sun, and we cannot s see the moon at that time. Uh, then about seven days after new moon, we have first quarter moon, and this means that as we look up at the moon in the sky, the so right half of it is illuminated. Then about seven days later, we have full moon, and we have a complete disk that's present. We see the whole, the whole moon that's uh, lit up. Uh, then about seven days later, we go to a last quarter moon. And at this particular time, uh, as you look up at the moon in the sky, we are seeing the sort of left half of the moon that's being illuminated. Seven days later, we get to new moon again, and we lose sight of the moon in the sky. All right. Is that covered? Thank you very much. Okay, You're welcome. thanks very much. Uh, what I was getting to with the uh, talking about the lunar eclipse, there, the sky always seems to be changing, which is uh, something that fascinates me. As long as you know what's going on, you can look up. Uh, there are several other things you can witness with the moon. Uh, it tends to pass in front of uh, bright stars, too. Yeah, we can have events known as occultations occur. When uh, Actually, there are two different kinds of events, occultations and grazes, which, which can occur. Uh, this is something which amateur astronomers are interested in. We can go out and uh, look at the, uh, uh, look to see if there's any bright stars that the moon is going to pass in front of, and then do timings of when that event takes place, when the moon actually uh, blocks off the light of the, of the star, and then again perhaps when the moon reappears, or sorry, the star reappears from, from behind the moon. And this is helpful in determining things like the orbit of the moon. Um, we don't actually, strange as it may seem, have a very good idea about the orbit of the moon. We don't know it accurately enough to really predict exactly where it's going to be. Well, again, I'd like to invite you to give us a call here at 752-8911 and any questions you might have on astronomy or the upcoming lunar eclipse. Good evening. Thanks for phoning Astronomy Toronto. Yes, uh, good evening. I was wondering if you could uh, describe the lunar influences on the tides, uh, how that occurs, and also uh, considering the fact that human beings are uh, consisting of such a high proportion of water where there's been any study at all uh, in that respect with the moon's influence. OK, 
Okay, there's two, there are two major influences that cause tides on the Earth. Uh, first of all, if we just, uh, just eliminated uh, the moon, for example, let's just pretend the moon is not there, uh, as the, the, the sun does have a gravitational effect on the, on the Earth. Uh, the Earth is covered with uh, uh, fluid, which we call the, the, the oceans, and uh, this results in tides being raised on the side of the Earth, which is closest to the sun. And for a little bit more complicated reason, it takes a little bit, little bit, little bit harder to explain, we also have a, a high tide which can appear on the opposite side of the Earth to where the sun is. Now, as well, apart from the, the influence of the sun, we do happen to have uh, a moon. In fact, most of the tides that occur on the Earth are caused by the moon itself. Uh, if we actually eliminated the moon, there would be relatively low tides, very little change in the tides on the Earth. Um, it might be rather interesting to speculate how, uh, how life might have kind of get washed up on the seashore, shall we say, if we did not have very much in the way of tides uh, present on our, our planet. But anyway, the, um, the tides, the lunar tides, are caused by, uh, again, the gravitational influence of the moon. We, uh, most of the tides we have on the Earth, the high tides, are caused by the actual uh, gravitational effect of the moon. You mentioned a little bit earlier about the human beings being mostly consisting of water, and uh, certainly this is true. I don't know qu quite offhand the percentage, but it's quite a high Very percentage high. Of, the, of the human body made, it made of water. Certainly it can have a, an influence, but we have to realize that although the moon is a massive object, it's quite far away from us, uh, and actually there's a lot of other things closer to us which can have a much stronger gravitational influence uh, on us. There have been no, uh, again, no real studies that have been conducted that I'm aware of. I know that there are several groups that are thinking about setting up studies, but it's hard to set up control experiments, so we actually know what is, what is happening with this. Right. Uh, well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the show. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Thanks very much. Bye. We were talking about looking at the, the moon going in front of stars. Uh, something that I'm going to try for the first time during this eclipse is what they call uh, crater timings. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting experiment. Maybe you can tell us a bit about that. Okay, well, crater timings. Uh, first of all, we have to realize the moon is covered with thousands, millions of craters. And these craters are, have been caused by uh, impacts of uh, objects from space that have come down, collided with the moon, been a tremendous explosion, and we have this kind of hole or pit left in the surface of the moon. One of the things that uh, many amateurs do at the times of uh, eclipses uh, whether it's a partial eclipse or a total eclipse, is do crater timings. And this is where we uh, observe the a selection of lunar craters. It's not sort of any old crater that you happen to see on the moon, because certainly we know there's thousands and millions of craters there. Instead, there's usually a selected group of roughly about uh, all between 20 and 30 craters. Uh, I figure it's usually about 24 craters that are selected. These are known locations, nicely distributed over the face of the moon. And what we do is observe when the moon's shadow reaches these craters. Uh, and we make a, a timing. Uh, so we notice the moon's shadow come on. We have to have a telescope read to, in order to do this. Uh, as soon as the moon's shadow reaches the moon, that particular crater, we make a, uh, a record of what time it happens to be. Now, it's not just a matter of picking up your wristwatch and sort of saying, oh, well, it's such and such a, you know, 3.30 in the morning or something like that. Your time has to be accurately synced with, uh, with a, a time signal. For example, uh, WWV in the United States or, or CHU uh, from Ottawa, so that you have an accurate time that you're making the, the measuring with. Um, what we do is we come along again, measure the time when the shadow just reaches the lip of the crater. We make another timing when the shadow just reaches the far wall of the crater. And then we average those timings, and we get more or less when the shadow was, was crossing the center of the, of the moon. Uh, we can usually get fairly accurate timings, uh, as far as crater timings are concerned. And many amateurs do this. And you've only got about 24 objects to, uh, to spot. Uh, I know that the Toronto Center, for example, is setting up uh, plans to observe this lunar eclipse. Uh, we've got uh, 24 objects, if I remember the, <laughs> the number correctly, 24 objects, which are uh, have been designated as objects that are for, for crater timings. And hopefully we're going to get some results from our, our members. Maybe if we could put up that table again <coughs> and give you a, 
for a few minutes and, and show the times of this, this eclipse. Again, it, it's July 5th, the night of July 5th, but the early morning July 6th, all night practically. And weather permitting, we'll, uh, we'll have a good show of that. And if we can get that table up, also, you know, I want to um, talk to you about uh, uh, one thing that the Toronto Centre is doing in a few weeks, and that is uh, uh, a shopping mall display here in Toronto. Could you tell us a bit about that? Maybe some people in the audience would be interested in coming out and meeting Oh, certainly. That might be worth very worthwhile to mention. Um, one of the major things that the, the Royal Astronomical Society was, was formed for was to uh, the advancement of astronomy and, and science and also to publicize astronomy and, and get people interested in what's happening as far as astronomy is concerned. We have, uh, what we do is do we have public star nights, we have programs in libraries and uh, talks, and we set up telescopes for the public to, to look through. Uh, and on the weekend, or the Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, June 17th, 18th, 19th, we're going to be having a shopping mall display at the Bridalwood Shopping Mall, uh, which is up in the northeast end of the city, uh, Finch and Warden. This will be a three-day shopping mall display, Thursday night, uh, most of Friday, and uh, all of Saturday that the shopping mall is open. And there will be members present to talk about astronomy, talk about their hobby, uh, show off their telescopes. You can look at displays and, and uh, well, almost kind of see what a wacky bunch amateur astronomers are. <laughs> well, we have a good time anyway. We meet a lot of people who are, are, are very interested in astronomy. It's more and more people are getting interest in astronomy uh, because of the accessibility of uh, cheaper telescopes. Uh, uh, the Toronto Centre has a very large telescope which is available to our members if they want to use it. And it's a, it's a great way to learn uh, more about amateur astronomy. Might worthwhile to mention too is you don't really need a telescope in order to do astronomy. That's true. And a lot of people think that to get into astronomy you have to have a telescope present. Uh, certainly to observe this lunar eclipse you do not uh, have to have a telescope in order to see what's going on. You can just go out with your eyes and look up in the sky. There's a full moon sitting there and uh, observe this eclipse taking place. If you have binoculars or you have a telescope or you take pictures with a camera, that's, you know, you can see more. Mm -hmm. But certainly you do not have to have equipment in order to, to make, uh, observe a lot of different things. Again, we'd like to invite you to give us a call here at Astronomy Toronto at 752-8911. And any questions you might have on astronomy, we'd be glad to help you with. Uh, of course, we've been talking a bit about the lunar eclipse. Uh, something else in, in the sky that's been, uh, we've been able to notice in the last few months is a particular grouping of planets. Uh, many uh, of the viewers may remember on March 10th, there was a, uh, the so-called Jupiter effect occurred, which was a highly publicized non-event. That is, the, uh, the uh, planets were all lined up in a straight line to some people, but actually they were, they were in the same quadrant of the sky, but in very, very wide, wide spacing. And uh, there are several planets that are visible um, on any clear night. You'll be able to see uh, just in the southern sky, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. And we have a few slides that uh, we, could, we could look at on these planets. And uh, Ian, maybe you could tell us about, about this. And is it really that rare an event for the planets to you know, get in the same quadrant of the sky? Well, really it isn't. Uh, we have um, uh, certainly all the planets that are known planets that are orbiting, are orbiting around the sun uh, are very in a very flat plane. Uh, you can almost take a piece of paper and kind of put the planets on them. Um, and this means that in over the sky, the planets are spread over a very narrow region of the sky. So it's inevitable that uh, given the fact that the planets closest to the sun are moving relatively quickly and the ones furthest away are moving relatively slowly, that eventually you're going to have planets which are going to be together in some particular area of the sky. This is a picture uh, I took very close to March 10th and the, the very white dot, big blob on the left is the moon overexposed. Just to the right of it is Jupiter. And then the two bright spots up on the right are Mars and Saturn. And uh, if you remember that the moon is the size of your thumbnail, this is a very, very wide, broad expanse of the sky. And also the other planets were even off the screen. So You just took this photograph just using your camera on a tripod. Yeah, that's right. You just use it on a, on a tripod. Yeah, there's no telescope or anything that's involved in this particular photograph. Okay, thanks for phoning Astronomy Toronto. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Crazy, I'm to be on the TV. Yeah, okay. you're, you're on Yes, it. I'm on. Um, there's two parts to my question. One is I'm very curious about where the moon came from, what's the most, the latest theory. And also the other part that I'm curious about is about these explosions you were saying when a, cre when a meteor hits the moon. Have there been any, been any uh, photographs uh, taken of this event or because the, the crater seems so large, and, and I'm just so amazed that when 
the Earth is covered with its own atmosphere, the meteors burn up in our atmosphere before they hit us and don't make these giant craters that happen to the moon. So I'm curious both about the history of the moon and the history of the craters. Well, two very good questions. Yeah, well, certainly those are very good questions. Well, first of all, perhaps starting out with your first question about the origin of the moon, um, I, we have to admit that we really don't quite know exactly where the moon came from. The most current idea is that the moon formed about the same time as the Earth, uh, Earth formed. Uh, we've, uh, before the astronauts went to the moon in 1969 and brought back lunar samples, we uh, thought that probably the moon was about, about four and a half billion years old, which is about the same age as, as the Earth. When the astronauts went to the moon and actually studied the moon rock, brought some of this moon rock back to the Earth, uh, we again discovered the moon's, you know, the ages that seem to work out pretty well. The moon has about the same age as, as the Earth. Uh, we tend to think that uh, our, our current model of the solar system is that we had a, a large cloud of gas and dust, which for some reason started to collapse. Uh, in this, uh, as the cloud of gas and dust collapsed, the central regions of the cloud uh, increased in temperature uh, until they reached a temperature of about 15 million degrees. And at that temperature, we have nuclear reactions occur and our sun was born. Uh, while the sun was forming, we had uh, a whole bunch of little sort of eddies or little collections of, of matter uh, around the forming sun, which eventually became the planets. Um, today, we recognize nine planets. Um, possibly in the early solar system, there were quite a few, more than nine planets. But the ones that survive today are sort of the uh, ones who obey the traffic rules, if you like. Um, they formed in the same way that the sun did from collapsing bits of gas and dust. However, they're not massive enough to, uh, to get to very high temperatures. And as a result, they never triggered nuclear reactions. Um, in, the, uh, in the case of objects like Jupiter, for example, uh, Jupiter has uh, an internal heat source, but uh, it's possibly due to the fact that the planet is still collapsing. Um, our Earth's heat sources come from uh, uh, heating by uh, radioactivity and radioactive materials in the interior of the, of the Earth. We again think that the Moon formed around the Earth in the early days and uh, there have been suggestions, or there was a suggestion I guess maybe a hundred years ago that maybe the, the Moon had originally been inside the Earth and somehow had escaped or separated from the Earth and had been in orbit, but there's a lot of it's hard to imagine that taking place, and there doesn't really seem to be any evidence for it. There's been another theory around that maybe the moon is a captured object, one that was sitting around some other, in some other part of the solar system, and then was captured by the Earth. It again, it's very hard to imagine how the Earth could capture such a large object. In many ways, the moon and the Earth are sort of a twin planet. Um, the moon is only about 1 80th of the Earth's mass, but it still is a relatively large object com compared with its primary, the Earth. Um, so this is sort of a very simplified view of how we think the, the Moon possibly formed. We, we generally think it formed around the Earth about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, as far as the craters themselves are concerned, uh, in the early days of the solar system, we had all different kinds of uh, bits of rock, primordial planets, uh, uh, large oh, moons, asteroids, all different kinds of stuff, all kind of whizzing around the solar system. And as uh, time passed, as um, the planets moved around in the orbits, they would, these stuff would collide with larger bodies, and, and gradually the planets would build up. They would, with their increasing size, this would give them a larger gravitational field, which means they can attract more material into them. And these oh, asteroids, chunks of rock, small meteors could crash into these bodies and gradually add material until they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we have our, our planets forming. Um, pretty well in the first maybe several hundreds of millions of years of the solar system, the solar system was pretty well swept clean. Most of this material was gathered up by the, the forming planets. Interplanetary space today is basically empty. There is not very much uh, rock or, or dust floating around, um, but certainly there are still a lot of asteroids. We, we guess that there are probably tens of thousands of asteroids ranging in size from maybe a, a few centimeters up to uh, maybe a thousand kilometers or so, which are moving through interplanetary space. Uh, it is more or less inevitable that given enough time, these objects are eventually going to collide with something else. 
uh, from studying uh, asteroids that are traveling through the solar system today, it appears that some of them are made up of um, different chemical abundances. Some, there are some asteroids that we consider to be basically iron asteroids. There are others that seem to be made of lighter material. And the suggestion has been, has been that maybe um, some of these asteroids are the remnants of much larger asteroids that have been hit by other objects and smashed up, broken up into different segments and kind of flung over the solar system. Um, these objects are moving around, hitting the planets occasionally. The Earth was hit by, uh, uh, has been hit by asteroids or in, in the past. Um, the Arizona meteor crater in Arizona is uh, an example of uh, the Earth being hit by an object about the size of a house. Uh, in Canada, we recognize about 60 meteor craters that have been caused by objects from space colliding with the Earth. Um, there's a meteor crater just outside of Kingston. There's another one up in Algonquin Park. Uh, there's quite a few in the region of the Canadian Shield. Um, Plus the, um, <coughs> if I might just uh, sure. bring in the, each of the inner planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, and Mars, all have tremendous craters, and each one of them have a huge, but each of them have their own little huge basin. That's right. Well, some of these are up to about maybe 1,000 kilometers in diameter. And actually, in the, on the moon, for example, the lunar seas uh, are actually basins that have been caused by uh, large chunks of rock, asteroids, if you like, which have hit the moon. It's been a tre again, tremendous explosion. It kind of carves out a basin. And in the case of the moon, uh, these basins have then been filled up with lava that has kind of gushed up from the interior of the moon, and uh, this material, this lava is then frozen, and here we have these flat plains. And because the, these flat plains have very few craters on them, it tells us that these seas, or the Mary as we call them, are younger than the rest of the surface of the moon, which is very heavily cratered in this very old surface. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, a, that's a mouthful. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. great. Hi, thanks for phoning. Hello? Hi. Oh, yes. Uh, perhaps uh, you could explain to me about the Earth-Moon-Gravity-Well uh, theory and uh, the Langrangian points, and if the Moon will be used for um, future uh, uh, nuclear war or catapults, as they call, or higher-energy laser stations. That's a lot of a question. That's, uh, <laughs> I think well, maybe the gravity well would be, uh, we'd be biting off a lot. Yeah, you know, I, I think basically anything that, um, it's, it's worthwhile to think, anything that possesses mass possesses gravity. Um, and again, dra gravity is something that kind of pulls things together. In the case of a, uh, the more mass an object has, um, the greater the attractive force, the greater the ex strength of its gravitational field out into interplanetary space. Now, uh, basically, as uh, our, we could represent our Earth, for example, by what we might consider to be kind of a gravity well, if uh, a spacecraft, uh, say, was traveling through space, and as it started to approach the Earth, it would gradually be accelerated as it gets more and more into the Earth's gravitational field. And, uh, and then possibly, eventually, it might just kind of get pulled right into the Earth because of its, uh, the Earth's gravitational strength. The Earth has uh, a much greater gravitational field than, than the Moon does. Um, and uh, as a result, uh, the Moon does not hold on to atmosphere. Atmosphere escapes into, into space from it. The Moon cannot hold an atmosphere. The Earth's gravitational field is enough to hold uh, an atmosphere gases around it. Um, we think probably uh, there are what are known as Lagrangian points. There's five of them that are recognized. Uh, two of them are possible places where the Earth-Moon gravitational field balances off and uh, these might be places where we might put space stations. But as for nuclear war and lasers on the moon, I'm afraid we really can't help you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Hi, thanks very much for phoning. Hi, I'd like to, you told me that, um, uh, that the Earth and the moon were created relatively at the same time. Is that right? That's right. We think about four and a half billion years ago. Okay, then why is it that you said that the moon's surface was so heavily cratered and that the Earth isn't nearly so heavily cratered from why it took out? Okay, well, certainly that's a... The reason is that on the... Things have not changed on the moon in the course of, of, of literally billions of years. There is no water on the moon. 
There's no uh, atmosphere of gases, and as a result, there's no weathering. There's nothing to wear down the craters. On the Earth, any kind of landform that we have, whether it's a, uh, a hole in the ground, uh, a mountain, a lake, uh, a ridge, anything else, gets worn down by erosion. Uh, we have wind, for example, that uh, wears away things. We have water that falls on things and washes away uh, craters and mountains, things like that. And uh, this is what's happened. The Earth's surface is actually relatively young. Um, the ocean floors, for example, are only a few hundreds of millions of years old. Oh, I see. So what's happening is that as the craters have arrived, or as things have smashed into the Earth, they have been cleared up and washed away. That's right. There's very few old craters on our planet. Yeah, oh, I see. Okay. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks very much. Well, uh, I guess that's about all the time we have. Uh, thanks very much to everyone out there who's been phoning in. Uh, uh, again, the, the lunar eclipse is uh, July 5th, 6th. Hope, hope you do get a chance to maybe get, set your alarm at 3.30 and run out in your pajamas and take a quick look, or even if you want to brave the weather, you can get out and uh, take a look at it. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ian McGregor from the McLaughlin Planetarium for coming out and uh, for being a much of a part of these, uh, these, this series. Thank you for inviting me, Randy. Toronto. And uh, again, at the end of the show, on the credits, we will be uh, displaying the address that you can write to if you're interested in uh, finding out more about the Toronto Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Again, it's a group of amateur and professional astronomers more or less interested in learning more about the sky, getting out and enjoying the, the sky from the Toronto and especially out away from the Toronto city lights. So thanks very much for watching Astronomy Toronto and we'll be seeing you again real soon.